Thank you for the introduction. Um, thanks also to Ivo Apple and the other conference organizers for the invitation to speak here today at the fourth Hamburg International Environmental Law Conference. The topic regulation of harvest normally refers to the international law, port state jurisdiction, as well as to the national ports law and increasingly also the European ports law at the present port package three. My approach is a different one since I want to introduce a new perspective on the regulation of harvest. And this is the perspective of international administrative law. So the aim of my presentation this afternoon is to show that the regulation of harvest constitutes a typical object of international administrative law. My thoughts are developed in four steps, addressing both international administrative law in general and its realization in the context of harvest. These points include, at first, a look at the concept of international administrative law, secondly, a summarizing of the role of harvest in maritime governance, then I will address the elements of international administration which can be found in the context of harvest. And finally, I will inquire the added value of this new perspective. To more information um, regarding the terminology, I do not distinguish between ports and harvest, but I treat them as synonyms. And I only address harvest as an instrument to regulate the environmental uh, impacts of shipping. International administrative law is not simply a branch of general international law. Rather, international administrative law proceeds from a view what constitutes administration beyond a purely domestic context. However, the term international administrative law is not devoid of ambivalence. In a traditional legal context, international administrative law um, refers to the internal matters of international organizations. For example, um, staff issues, budgetary affairs of international organizations. Other early works on international administrative law address the national public law on conflicts of law. Regarding two recent works, international administrative law as a research field reflects the impacts of the globalization on administrative activities and on administrative law. Um, these works have strongly been influenced from an American research project um, based at the NYU School of Law. According to this recent concept, international administrative, international administrative law forms a third division of administrative law, which can be added to the both common divisions, the national administrative law, representing territoriality, and the European administrative law, representing Europeanization. In contrast to the early concepts, the topics are not only the activities of international organizations and not only national laws, rather it encompasses both levels. In the wording of Eberhard schmidt assmann international administrative law is to be understood as the administrative law originating under international law and involving processes of reshaping national law and reconstructing international law. The aim of this recent concept is at first to describe and analyze the impacts of the globalization on administration and then to answer the normative issues of global governance with no worldwide authority in sight. In other words, questions of legitimacy and questions of legal protection <coughs> against the international administration. And I adopt this recent concept. I think the field of maritime governance is the ideal field of reverence for international administrative law since shipping is a typical globalized industry and harbors play an important role in the regulation of shipping since they combine the ability to regulate ships with some interest to do so. Now, 
I want to give an overview about the role of harvest in maritime governance by addressing the three topics port state control, green harvest, and ship waste management in harbors. Um, I will only summarize these topics since other conference speakers deal with them in detail. Port state control is the control of foreign flagged ships in ports by national port state control offices. Port state control does not set any, any new standards, but enforces the standards which have been developed at the international level. Um, these international standards also concern the protection of the marine environment, just think of the Marco Convention. Where port state control officer finds deficiencies, the officer may re require their rectification and in serious cases also the detention of the ship or even the banning of the ship from the, from the port. As a consequence of especially the Amoko Cadiz incident, regional port state control regimes have been developed. The idea of such regime is that the elimination of substandard shipping, meaning ships that do not comply with the international standards, would be best achieved by alliances of national port state control authorities. These regimes, which harmonize port state control in a region, do not act on the basis of an international treaty, but their basis are mere agreements between maritime authorities also known as Memorandum of Understanding, MOU. The first um, regional agreement of this kind was the Paris MOU. That's the blue one on a graphic. Paris MOU encompasses 27 port state control authorities from Europe, including the Russian Federation and from Canada. The Paris MOU was the model upon which many other regions of the world have um, established their agreements on port state control, as you can see on the graphic. Despite of their informal character, these port state control MOUs have established their own institutions. Here you can see um, the structure of the Paris MOU. It includes, for example, a own secretariat and a member committee. Um, a great advantage of these port state control MOUs is that each MOU has a own database with shipping information. In the case of the Paris MOU, it is called Thetis, the information system, as you can see on the graphic. This shipping information um, forms the basis for an innovative weapon, the naming and shaming. It works like this. Once a vessel is detained, by a port state control officer, it will appear on the list of detained shipped, uh, ships available on the website of the relevant MOU. Here you can see the black list of the Paris MOU from 2019. Sometimes there are also reports or pictures of um, rusty buckets. Here, for example, um, the ship Bellatrix, which have been banned from the Paris MOU region. The aim of this form of publication is to make maritime industry stakeholders aware of substandard ships and their owners and operators because the risk of losing profit shall encourage owners and operators to comply with the international standards. Paris MOU is closely linked with the EU. This is because inconsistencies in the application of the Paris MOU led the EU to adopt its Directive on Port State Control in 1995, and this directive rendered port state control mandatory for the EU member states. After the Prestige and the Erika oil tanker disaster, the EU has further enhanced its port state control regime. To give an example, the so-called Erika II package um, involved the establishment of the European <coughs> Maritime Safety Agency, EMSA, based in Lisbon, and um, monitors the implementation of the EU port state control regime, and EMSA also manages, hosts, and operates the database of the Paris MOU Thetis. 
the International Maritime Organization, IMO, encouraged the worldwide harmonization of port state control. For example, the IMO procedures on port state control um, are basic guidances on the conduct of port state control inspections. And every two years, the IMO hosts workshops for port state control MOU secretaries and database managers. Um, these IMO workshops, um, they form a kind of platform for cooperation and provide a forum for the regional MOUs to exchange ideas and experiences. My next, uh, next example are Queen Ports. I will um, address two points, echo ports and green port fees. Echo ports is a regional network of port authorities for sharing experiences in port environmental management. It was initiated by a number of proactive ports in 1997 and has now been fully integrated in the European Seaports Organization, ESPO, since 2011. Ecoports also fosters port services aiming to encourage greener shipping, and for this reason it offers a toolkit which encompasses a self-audit system. It has developed environmental performance indicators to measure the green performance of its member ports, and it also offers an environmental assessment by independent auditors called PERS. So the good green ports get a PERS certificate. Um, Hamburg does not have the PERS certificate, but I think the Jade Visa port has one. An instrument used by many port authorities are green port fees. The principle of green port fees is to charge lower fees to ships that are less polluting. In most cases, this is done by a deduction of the regular port fees either as a fixed amount or as a proportional deduction. For example, get, um, the cleaners chips get a 10% um, rabbit on the regular port fee. Sweden was the front runner, but nowadays green port fees are widely used. About 28 of the major world ports apply them. Um, however, green port fees are um, highly controversial instruments since their efficiency isn't clear. This is because um, of different green port fees approaches and another reason is that the difference in fees for the dirtiest and the cleanest ships is usually very small, normally in the order of 5% to 20% and this leads to the risk of mere dead weight effects. So recently, the OECD and the EU strongly advocate a harmonized and stricter approach of green port fees. My last example um, addresses ship waste management and harbors. Port reception facilities receive several types of waste generated from a seagoing vessel. So the presence of port reception facilities is an integral precondition to minimize waste discharges into the sea by ships. Hence, the Marco Convention Annex 5 says that port states have the obligation to provide port reception facilities. Globally, port reception facilities are managed in very different ways. Even in a single harbor, not all port reception facilities are managed centrally, but often by a myriad of um, public and also commercial groups. However, there are approaches to harmonize the different um, management approaches of port reception facilities. To give an example, several regional regimes support a harmonized fee system called the No Special Fee System, and the system shall encourage the use of port reception facilities. Such a No Special Fee System is an indirect charging system where costs of um, reception, handling, and disposal of ship-generated wastes are regularly included in the port fee. You can compare such a no special fee system with a flat rate because um, the delivery, uh, the waste delivery is levied on every ship calling at the port irrespective of the actual use of the port reception facility. 
So since no additional costs are imposed on ships using the port reception facility, and no spe special fee system provides incentives to discharge waste onshore and not offshore. Such a no special fee system has been recommended under the framework of the Helsinki Convention and the proposal for the revision of the EU Port Reception Facility Directive provides for a 100 no special fee system. I have summarized the role of harbors in maritime governance. So is this international administration? The concept of international administrative law um, approaches the question of what constitutes the international administration by describing particular elements. In the following, I want to show that these elements can be found in the regulation of harbors. These elements address the organization, the instruments, and the law of the international administration. According to Sabino Cassese, the international administration has a marbled structure. This means that there is a great variety of actors involved next to domestic regulatory agencies, private and even hybrid actors are part of the international administration. Many international organizations also engage and furthermore, one can observe a growing cooperation of public authorities in the form of transnational networks. In contrast to the common notion of national administration, there is no hierarchical link between all these actors. This is why the structure is marbled, according to Sabino Cassese. Regarding harbors, we could see that the starting point of regulatory activities are such transnational networks of public authorities the port state control regimes and echo ports. Private actors can also be involved, for example, in the management of port reception facilities. Despite of these transnational networks, there are still cross-national discrepancies which can <coughs> distort the market by promoting the so-called port shopping phenomenon. This is a strategy used by ships or ship operators who prefer certain ports over others because of their um, less stringent regulation. And this problem sets the starting point for international organizations like the IMO or for regional actors like the EU who aim to harmonize the different regulatory activities and harbors. The IMO has an overarching but not, an hierarchic, not a hierarchical function. Just think of port state control the IMO only constitutes a forum for the regional port state control MOUs um, in order to harmonize the port state control globally. And the IMO does not control the port state control regulation of the EU either, rather the EU pursues more and more its own port state control um, approach. So we can say we have a marbled structure in the context of harvest. The international administration often uses positive and negative incentives to enforce international standards. The reason is that globalized industry are difficult to regulate since they act in different states and they can easily devise avoidance strategies. And this difficult enforcement situation suggests the need to develop incentive-based instruments. The um, idea of such incentive-based instruments is, um, or the reason is, that they do not exclusively rely on public authorities' um, activities. I will clarify this idea of incentives with the example of naming and shaming. In the case of naming and shaming, public authorities only have to yes, uh, publicize infringements on the internet and the market system sanctions the infringing companies by avoiding any business connections with them. That's the idea. Hence, there are, in theory, negative incentives that can foster the worldwide enforcement situation. 
Regarding harvest, the port state control MOUs use the instrument of naming and shaming, and in interviews, port state control officers and the Paris MOU said that it uh, would be a highly effective instrument to improve enforcement. And furthermore, green port fees and a no special fee system uh, constitute example of positive incentives. So we have th this instrument. Some international administrative law derives from standard sources of law. The law can be found on the international as well as at the national level or regional level. However, many of the features of the interna international administrative law have evolved as part of the mere practices of international organizations, transnational networks, or uh, forms of private lawmaking. Hence, legal pluralism and informality um, characterize the law of the international administration. Regarding harvest, we have seen that different forms of hard law, like the Marpol Convention, EU directives, and national law, like the Ships Up by Gesetz, um, refer to the environmental protection in and through harvest. And furthermore, soft law like um, the MOUs or the IMO port, uh, port state control procedures play a significant role because they harmonize the different approaches and the regulatory activities of harvests. So we also have the typical law of the international administration. The single phenomena that I have summarized in the second part of my presentation are well known. So what is the added value to describe and analyze the regulation of harbors from the perspective of international administrative law? At first, international administrative law underlines that the regulation of harbors is embedded in a plethora of actors and legal layers. Harbors are not actors that are controlled by other actors. Rather, harbors are points of entry, and in this function, they constitute starting points for regulatory activities on different levels, and this includes forms of self-regulation. Secondly, the perspective of international administrative law can draw the attention to typical administrative problems. I want to clarify this thesis with the example of naming and shaming under the Paris MOU. Naming and shaming raises the question of legal protection against false accusations. To give an example, a port state control officer in Hamburg detains the ship um, Queen of the Seas, IMO number 1234567, mm -hmm. However, because of a mistake, the wrong ship, the ship DAISY IMO number 1234568, appears on the blacklist of the Paris MOU. So what can the ship owner, the ship operator can do? In the national setting, the entities affected can seek judicial review also against naming and shaming, at least in Germany. However, obtaining judicial protection against the international administration is much more difficult because of the plenty of actors involved and because of the informal character of the international administration. I will explain this in the following. Under the Paris MOU, the Secretariat, which is based in the Netherlands, in The Hague, publicizes the shipping information, whereas the national port state control authorities in Germany, the BG Verkehr, Dienststelle Schiffssicherheit, provide the shipping information. So against which party could an action be brought? Since the national port state control authorities detain and ban the ships, route to legal protection against or before national courts have to be considered. However, there are several problems. Even if the detention was illegal, can national port state control authorities correct the naming and shaming on the website of the Paris MOU? And what is if the naming and shaming is illegal because of a mistake of the Paris MOU secretariat or because of a mistake of the common database thesis, which is managed by EMSA? 
Alternatively, proceedings could be brought against the Paris MOU because the real harm is caused by the centralized publication in the form of blacklists, reports, and pictures. But this presupposes that the Paris MOU has separate legal personality, and this is very doubtful. Um, despite of their own institution, it remains a mere informal agreement between public authorities. How to give effective legal protection against the international administration is a highly controversial issue. In my opinion, due to the problems of judicial review against the international administration, one should consider alternative forms of legal protection. Um, the context of harbors illustrates that alternative forms of legal protection can work. The Port State Control MOUs offer our own appeal procedure, which is called a detention review procedure. This detention review procedure does not cause the detention or banning of the ship to be suspended, but the ship owners and um, operators can get the correction of the wrong shipping information in the common database of the relevant port state control MOU. And in the Paris MOU, there are about 30 detention review procedures in a year. So international administrative law can illustrate that um, um, there are many difficulties um, regarding judicial review against the international administration. Thank you for your attention.